All right, I think we're live. We're going to go ahead and start. So I'd like to call the City of Mount Vernon City Council meeting for March 10th, 2021 to order. The time is now 6.03. Um, item B is our Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd ask if you join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and, to, and the to the republic for which it stands, which it stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, justice and justice for all. Thank you. Item C is our roll call of council members. Uh, council member Gary Molinar. Here. Council member Melissa Beaton. Here. Council member Mark Holst. Here. Council member Mary Hudson. Here. Council member Iris Kaviev. Here. Council member Richard Brocksmith. Here. And council member Juan Morales. Present. Thank you. Under consent agenda, we have items A, B, C, and D, approval of minutes, payroll, checks, wire transfers, and claims. I would move the uh, approval of the consent agenda. Thank you. Second. Motion by Mark and a second by Mary. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Under reports tonight, item A is first up is our review of emails from the public. Peter Donovan will present. Peter. Thank you, Mayor. Hi, Council. I hope you're doing well this evening. We've got a couple of comments from the public. As City Council knows, as we've been unable to meet in person, the public's had the opportunity to address City Council by submitting written comments to uh, an email address or writing into City Hall. The email address, I believe, is up on the screen. It's council at mountvernonwa.gov. And I would think that when City Council resumes in-person meetings, that this would still be an option likely for residents to address Council if they I did not feel yeah, comfortable visiting council meetings in person. Uh, the first of two emails tonight comes from Larry Hilliard. Larry writes, Dear Mayor and City Council, kudos for moving forward on this project. My wife and I fully support this and look forward to the day it becomes a reality. I should have noted that the subject line of this email was new library community center parking. Thank you, Larry Hilliard, Maddox Creek. The next one is from Katie Armagas. It says, I'd like to commend Mayor Jill and staff on the dogged persistence in getting Mount Vernon so much closer to the long sought library parking community center that so many people have wanted and worked for over the 30 years I've called this city my home. And I urge the council to take advantage of all the work that's been done to bring it to completion. This project is a true example of good planning and steady stewardship while responding to the expressed wishes and needs of this community. Let's get this thing done. Sincerely, Katie. That's all of the comments tonight, Mayor. Okay, okay. Thank, you. thank you. Item B tonight is department updates and we have quite the public works world tonight. So um, as council knows, we've combined our committee and uh, council agendas. So um, we've got quite the robust list. So I'm gonna turn it over to Esco Bell, our public works director. Go ahead, Esco. Thank you, Mayor. Let me just make sure I'm up and sharing my screen. Can everybody see that blue public works up to date screen? Looks yes. good. All right, yes. great. Uh, we're gonna go ahead, like yeah, the mayor said, Blaine's gonna introduce Damon Eisner on our stormwater plan. So go ahead, Blaine. Uh, good evening, Mayor. Uh, thank you and uh, city council. Yes, uh, it's that time of year, March, where we do the uh, stormwater management program. And um, the city has uh, been working with Brown and Caldwell well, since we started the permit, which was 2007. Uh, Brown and Caldwell is currently helping the city with permit compliance, review, uh, review comment, preparation of the current permit cycle uh, 2019 through 2024. Uh, we have a Damon Deesner here with us tonight to present the city's draft 2021 stormwater management program. Damon is part of the Brown and Caldwell water resource team. Uh, Brown and Caldwell has a significant amount of stormwater experience and currently assists a number of jurisdictions within the Puget Sound, such as Skagit County, 
city of Puyallup, Mukilteo, and there's several other small and large jurisdictions in the region that they help. Uh, Damon has been in the stormwater field for over 42 years, and I believe his title is scientist, but he can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, he's a great help and resource uh, when we need him, uh, when we have college questions on ecology or other questions about regional activities. Um, so with that, we'll let Damon jump in here. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, I am Damon Diesner with the environmental engineering firm of Brown and Caldwell. Um, and I'm not a scientist. I guess <laughs> that's what they have me listed in for payroll purposes, but I am really more of a policy planner and strategic planner. Um, and I'm here to help you this evening understand a little bit more about this so called NPDES uh, phase two stormwater management program. Next slide, please. So what we're trying to do um, this evening is um, we uh, move on to the next slide. Thank you. What we're going to what we're trying to do um, this evening with this presentation are a couple of things. One is we're trying to meet the um, requirement or helping to meet the requirement for public involvement, public participation. Uh, the public gets to see the, um, the presentation here and understand a bit more and give it, and they'll have opportunity to comment uh, if they have any issues, questions, or suggestions. So um, what we'll talk about tonight is uh, the background on the permit regulation, how we got there, what all of this means, um, talk about what the city is doing to stay in compliance with this federal permit, uh, the annual compliance documents that need to be prepared and submitted. We'll talk a little bit about the future requirements that are coming on down the road as a result of this permitting process. And we will have time for questions and comments at the end. If I could just move it quickly, next slide, please. Um, so the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System, NPDES permit, is an outgrowth of the Federal Clean Water Act, and that regulates discharges into the federal waters of the U.S., which includes, of course, uh, the Skagit River and Puget Sound. Uh, the NPDES permit is administered by the Washington State Department of Ecology, uh, the federal agency EPA, having given up their responsibility in turning over to the state to do this at a more local level. Uh, the overall goal of this permit is to make all waters of the U.S. fishable and flowable. Um, and what they're expecting from the local jurisdictions is to develop, to develop and implement and enforce the stormwater management program uh, that we're presenting you this evening to reduce uh, pollution coming from your stormwater management system. Uh, next slide, please. There are nine main elements to this permit, uh, stormwater planning, public education and outreach, public involvement and participation, mapping and documentation, and that MS4 is, a, uh, I guess, a federal uh, code for municipal separate storm sewer systems, or pipes and, and ditches and streams that empty into streams and rivers. Uh, illicit discharge detection and elimination, which finds pollutant sources uh, and stops them. Controlling runoff from new development and redevelopment construction sites to provide erosion control and long term uh, pollution and flow control uh, for each of those sites. Operations and maintenance requirements uh, to the city uh, that the city has implemented over time. A source control program for existing development. Uh, again, trying to uh, find potential pollutant at its source and stop it in the city system. And then stormwater monitoring and assessment is also a requirement of this permit. Next slide, please. Um, so the, the new requirements, and there are basically two big ones. Uh, one is the, um, the stormwater management action plan where the city needs to go and uh, take a look at um, all the different uh, drainage basins and sub basins within the city, assess them, uh, assess which might provide the greatest water quality benefit, look at opportunities uh, for partnering with others, and um, come up with a plan for uh, both long term and short term actions to deal with uh, pollution problems coming from that particular basin. 
Um, and then in existing development source control uh, pollution, we will be ramping up inspections for those private systems over time with this uh, iteration of the five-year permit cycle. Next slide, please. So this is a permit that's issued not just to the Public Works Department, but to the city as a whole. And so there are, are many uh, folks involved across the city organizations trying to make sure that the city stays in compliance. Um, primarily, you know, coordinated by Public Works, but uh, also our development services and our OIM and parks and, and a number of other types of, of uh, departments in the city. Next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things the permit requires is that an annual report be submitted to ecology, and this is a look back at what we did during the last year uh, to be in compliance uh, with the federal regulations. Um, that report is in progress, it's being developed, but at this point, once again, it appears that the city is going to be in full compliance uh, with all of these federal requirements. That uh, report is due to be sent to ecology on March 31st. This year. Next slide, please. Uh, and then another, the program plan uh, that we're talking about tonight is our look forward. It talks about uh, what the city has identified it needs to do to remain in compliance with state and federal regs regarding surface water quality. Uh, the draft is made available on the city's public web website. Uh, for public comment, and we submit this final plan to ecology again on March 31st. Uh, with, and then the, the final plan is posted to the city's website at the end of May. Next slide, please. So the city will continue uh, to go on doing what it's been doing for the last 15 years and still more practices, uh, recognizing that some new things are going to have to ramp up over time. Um, and the city will submit the annual reporting materials. And uh, rather than performing uh, stormwater monitoring, the city by itself um, will be planning to take advantage of the Department of Ecology's offer to do the monitoring uh, for a fee. And that fee is very expensive in terms of doing it on your own, uh, both due to uh, economies of scale, as well as avoiding the ecology approval process for monitoring plan, which takes a long time, a lot of staff time, a lot of money. So, um, next slide, please. Are there any questions? All right. Well, thank you, Damon, for your report, and we'll just uh, move on then. All right, thank you very much. All right, all right. Go ahead, Blaine, you've got the next topic. Gotta unmute first, there we go. Um, <laughs> Maddox Creek uh, Repairing and Planting. Um, last week and this week, uh, for the last two weeks, we, the county has hired a group called Earth Core. Um, and they are a nonprofit group out of Seattle that's been planting the riparian corridor along Maddox Creek where the culvert was removed last summer. Um, here's some photos of the work. And on the left, uh, we're showing the bank uh, of the ravine on the south side. And that doesn't do it justice with the steepness of that is uh, that photo doesn't uh, relay that as well as I would have liked. Uh, but it's pretty dang steep for those folks to be working on there. Um, I've seen some of the crew members walk, walking on all fours down there with a potted plant to try to try to go plant it. So there, it's a lot of hard work, and they're getting it done. You can see that there's there's plants on that slope right there. Um, and if you look, you can see some of the crew on the photo that's on the right. You can see some of the crew working on that slope. That's on the south side of the ravine, in that same area, of course. Uh, next slide, Esco. Um, Moving on to, uh, this is still the, the creek project, but I did want to highlight some work that was done um, by a re some local community members, a retired fish biologist, Kurt Buchanan, uh, and a couple of folks that live near him, Hal Lee and John Yeager. They near, live near the project side. They conducted a salmon survey 
from October of 2020 till uh, January of this year. Uh, the survey was conducted in the stream and that highlighted area in yellow from Blodgett to ba Blackburn is where they did that, that salmon survey. So next slide. Um, you could see on the photo, the photo that I took was, uh, this photo was from a video that they took when they were doing their survey. And you can see on the photo on the right, you can see the head of a salmon right here on the video. And you can also see the tail from another salmon uh, just off to the left of that salmon's head. It's, it's hard to see it, but that is the tail of a, another salmon. So there's a pair of salmon right there in that photo. And that was just upstream from where the culvert was. Uh, the photo on the left, of course, shows the culvert that many of you have seen many times where the fish couldn't get any farther upstream than that. Uh, next slide. And here we have another photo of an, another fish in the stream farther up than the culvert. Um, there is a video of their survey, and the fish walk video is located on our website at the city of Mount Vernon. Uh, if, you, if you go to the homepage, departments, public works, project updates, completed projects, uh, Maddox Creek culvert removal, you will be able to watch that two minute video on, uh, on the survey they did, and it'll show several salmon um, along the site. So I encourage anybody that's interested to take a look at that. So that's all I had for okay. a report. All right, we'll get going with Bill on some project reports. Well, good afternoon, Council. So um, updated you uh, the last work session meeting on the Colchon uh, safety, trail safety lighting project, but right now we're substantially complete with the project. The trail has all of the PSE street, light, uh, street lights installed and they're working. Um, the what's remaining is installing the security poles there. They are due to arrive on March 17th and do some of the uh, seating and the rest of the restoration for the, the length of the project. And then can, camera installation is expected to uh, potentially come in later this summer. Right now we're on budget with the project um, and uh, looking forward to getting it wrapped up here in the next couple of weeks. Next slide. So here's, uh, uh, council's seen this before, but here's a picture of the lights right after they got installed and I circled in red so you can tell which lights they are going down the um, the uh, Habitat for Humanity side of the trail. Bill, you also got uh, all this stuff cleaned yeah, up. Yeah, this is- Working on, the stream is protected and- Right. In this picture, you see, this was literally two hours after PSE got done. So after this um, was installed, uh, a couple of days afterwards, our crews came by with the street sweeper and and, and uh, swept all of this up. Um, and so right now it's uh, a well-functioning trail and, and there's people using it at night. So that's exciting as well. Okay. Next slide. So right now we are um, full steam ahead on our 2020 curb ramp improvements. We had brought this to the council in November and just through uh, weather and having the uh, contractor be ready, we've uh, just got to start on that uh, earlier this month. We're beginning on the west side of Division Street. And the next slide, you'll see a kind of a map of what we're doing, but we've got primarily most of this work being done on Division with a few other curb ramps throughout the city. Primarily this curb ramp uh, project is TIB money from our complete streets money we received uh, a few years back. And then it's also mixed with some TBD money to uh, anticipate some future uh, uh, paving projects. Getting the curb ramps done before we come through paving has some benefits. So. Uh, this project's going great guns. They should be done by the middle of June. There's over a hundred ramps to do. Um, not that many intersections, but each intersection has four ramps. So we're looking forward to uh, working with Trinity Construction to get it done. Next slide, please. And here's a picture of them working on one of the ramps next to the Catholic Church on West, West Division. Next slide. And then the 2021 street improvement project, which is our paving pro uh, program for 2021, 
uh, runs through uh, this list of roads, Little Mountain Road is, if you remember last year, we uh, dropped that just due to uh, funding concerns. We're back on the list now, and we have some uh, local streets in there as well. Then we're also partnering with PUD. We, I think we talked about that in a work session a little while ago to uh, pave First Street in conjunction with the PUD's uh, uh, water infrastructure upgrade. So we'll have First Street repaved from LaVenture to Wild Road when this is done. Next slide. So this is a quick map of our paving program that we intend to bring forward uh, this next year. It's out to bid right now. Uh, you got Little Mountain Road on the south there. There's just a section of it in the city. The local streets up at the top end, and then LaVenture and Fur in blue. And Fur Street again it is being performed and managed by Skagit PUD, and we are uh, partnering with them to get that full road paved instead of just half the road. Our, and I think opening, that is it. What's our bid opening is a couple of weeks from now, and we'll be poised to be able to start construction this summer, right? Correct. Okay. And we are not going to start construction till um, July 1st because we want the curb ramp pro, uh, project that's ongoing right now to be completely done before we pave so we don't interfere with the two different contractors. All right. Thank you, Bill. Okay. And then now it's my turn for a couple. And uh, we've been. Uh, we have some wastewater permit changes for no nutrients. And of course, this, this slide here shows you, you know, your wastewater treatment plan for the city, which of course has uh, about a hundred million dollars worth of facilities down there that treat the waste before they go into the Skagit River. And of course, that's all controlled, highly regulated, uh, comes from the federal laws of the Clean Water Act. And then it's handled at the state level by Department of Ecology through permits. So, they're always raising the bar and, and also monitoring to make sure that the actual treatment processes are having the goals that are intended by the Clean Water Act. So that, so what they're having in the Puget Sound is there's actually low dissolved oxygen levels. And uh, they've got a lot of data to prove that and they, that nutrients, that's nitrates and nitrates, nitrites and nitrates uh, contribute to this low dissolved oxygen. Those are mostly produced by wastewater treatment plants that go into the sound. And so uh, DOE has been working uh, to, to figure out how to distribute permit changes for each plant on what they have to do. So <clears throat> the city, as it turns out, this is good news, is, is a low producer of nutrients. And uh, our new requirements are gonna be able to be managed by just uh, doing uh, an, or, uh, an operation plan for how we'll manage these nutrient requirements that they're going to be putting upon us, but we won't have to do any capital construction at this time. Uh, you know, again, the, the bar always continues to go up, but whenever you got to do capital construction at a wastewater plant, it's usually multi millions of dollars. So that's that's good news that uh, we don't have to do that yet. And I'm trying to move my slide. Okay, this slide, I just wanted to, I won't go through each one of these lines. I just wanted to show you that the process is very step-by-step -step and procedural deal led by the Department of Ecology. They've been doing it starting in 2018 and uh, they issue notices and they set up a committee and, and all along we've had different opportunities to participate and make sure that the, uh, we're understanding what's going on and, and Gary Duranzo, our wastewater uh, division manager, he's here and he, they've, his staff has sat in on lots of these Zoom meetings and I've, I've been on at least uh, one recently. Anyway, uh, we're down here at the bottom uh, where they're implementing this. We know it's a fact. We'll have to, and they're fairly small for us. And if uh, Gary is on here, if we have any questions, uh, he'll have to back me up. So okay. This this particular topic was something that Councilmember Brocksmith had asked for a quick update on. So I guess I'll ask if this was the information you were looking for. 
Um, I sure appreciate uh, sharing this information with us. Um, it, I uh, thought it would just be good to kind of touch bases on that with the whole council so they knew what was coming. And it sounds like you've learned more um, recently about what it means for us. So that's that's really great. Um, the And I, it looks like there's a tie-in with the uh, HDR contract um, that we'll be approving later. So I know we'll be, you know, learning more and talking about this as we Whoops. I think he froze there. I think we okay. froze. But we um, might have gotten most of what he was saying. Yes, we have a topic later on, so we're on top of this subject. Okay. I'll ask um, the council member to give you a call if he has any other specific questions, too. So. Okay. okay. Thank you, Mayor. Yep. And I'll move to the next slide, which is also a little more focused on a little bit of regulatory information about our curbside recycle. And, of course, the council knows we've been talking about this uh, for a couple of months. Uh, you know, waste management, of course, provides curbside recycle by contract to the city. We're working on a new contract. We've got an item on the council tonight for just a, a temporary extension of that contract. But there are substantial increases. We've discussed those from 592, for example, for curbside recycle per container up to $10.54. It's driven primarily by the the commodity market, which they would sell the, the recyclables, that's dropped like 75%. So a lot of increase there. And, and so you may have some interest about just the basic requirements to do this. And so that's what I've got here in just a couple slides. And I can tell you from reading through this uh, again, is uh, state and regional law clearly promote residential curbside recycle, but it's not mandatory. Having said that, it is something that we have required and provided as a service for decades, since 1991. So, uh, just a minute, I gotta, oh, there we are. This next slide here, I just wanna show you, here's from the state laws, uh, uh, Washington, Revised Code of Washington, Chapter 70.95, addresses solid waste, and it's, again, it, you can read through there if you're, if you need to, sleep aids, <laughs> but it's, uh, I read through it and it's, uh, it does, uh, it promotes recycle for sure, but it doesn't require it. And I just, this sentence, let me read a couple of these sentences here. This is right off of the, uh, the uh, footnote to the chapter 70.95. Increasing available residential curbside service for solid waste, recyclable and compostable materials provides innumerable public benefits for all of Washington. Not only will Increased service provide better system-wide efficiency, but it will also result in job creation, pollution reduction, and energy conservation, all of which serve to improve the quality of life in Washington communities. It is therefore the intent of the legislature that Washington strives to significantly increase current residential recycling rates. Now moving on to just the county level, which uh, who produces the Skagit County Solid Waste Management Plan. That's also our waste management plan. Uh, we participate with them in developing that. And like state law, it doesn't require it as a mandate yet, but it clearly promotes the program. And I just have here a sentence from their executive summary of high priority recommendations. Skagit County will adopt a minimum service level ordinance requiring all waste collection subscribers to also receive curbside recycling service. So. Again, you don't you don't have to do what you've been doing for a long time, but I would strongly recommend that you continue uh, uh, doing what you've been doing. Longstanding practice of requiring curbside residential recycle, and it's and it obviously it'd be backtracking on where all the laws and all the uh, plans are heading us. So, unless you have any questions on that subject, I, Andy's here to help me if. I, uh, for council, I asked ESCO to, to just briefly sort of explain this. Um, I know that um, at least one of you had gotten a, a request from a resident to, you know, be able to stop their garbage service and things like that. So I thought it would be useful information to show you what the codes are, what the state, and then the solid waste plan from the county, which actually governs the disposal where we take our waste out to the transfer station. So. Um, if you have any questions about that as things move on, just feel free to call staff. So. 
Okay. Okay. Thank okay. you, Mayor. And then um, hold on, let's go. I think uh, Councilmember Proxmith was able to rejoin. So um, if there's any other questions, what we also said was that um, we'll uh, point you to call uh, staff if you have any specific thing back to the nutrient uh, wastewater issue. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Council. I have now to just our wastewater treatment plant admin building. We've been building that as the council knows. Uh, really happy to do that where we're adding remodeling space and adding space. So uh, that project is going to be complete in a couple of months on schedule. And here are some nice photos. You can see we're on the inside setting up walls and doing all the interior work is starting to take place very rapidly. And here's some nice shots on a beautiful day of, uh, you know, where Gary goes up on top of this one building and gets these nice shots. Anyway, you can see the 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 walls are all up and we, we've actually installed the roof on the new addition. So it's starting to get close to looking like what it's going to from the outside. And the last item on our report is just to, to report that the next traffic safety committee meeting is April 20th. So if anybody has anything about topics for that agenda, just send them our way and we'll make sure they get on there. All right. Thanks, Esco. Any Thank questions? you, Mayor. Any questions for Esco before the staff before we let him go? Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. We'll move into our library department update. And so Isaac Huffman, our library director, is here. Hello. And thank Hello. you. <laughs> I will share my screen. There you go. All right. Thank you. Um, welcome, Council. Uh, I just wanted to give you a quick update about the library and where we are right now. Um, first off, we are always getting ready for the public to re-enter the building, and we are doing that preparation work now, although we'll be still quite a few months out because of the restaffing issue that we have underway. We're getting the building ready for the public. Um, and we have lots of new additions, including these nice new blue shelving units you see here, um, which have uh, the added functionality of being on wheels. So we can roll them into our curbside configuration as you see now, and then into other locations as they are needed. Here's just another shot of how we're using them inside of the library. This uh, flexible shelving is something we want to carry forward into a new uh, building when we have that new structure. Um, it allows us to do many different things with the shelving over time. As you can see here, um, we've converted the shelving into our seed library, which has been a really uh, cool addition to the library over this uh, past little bit. Uh, we just are right around 100 seed packets uh, delivered to families. Um, this uh, program, again, is sort of really targeted at closing the, you know, nutrition gaps that families have by encouraging them to grow food as part of their own, you know, sort of family food strategy. Um, so we're really glad with that. Um, uh, along the same lines, we have got a new front desk. Uh, and as you can see, the front desk is different in a couple of ways one of which is a lot more open and now has all the plexiglass we'll need for uh, use, but it also um, is being able to be used two-sided. Right now we have it set up very two-sided. When the public re-enters, we will not use it two-sided as much, but that allows us to both do curbside and to uh, provide service to the customer at the same um, desk, which is a really cool thing. Uh, the architects who helped us design the desk really did a spot-on job. It's also ADA height accessible, so it goes up and down and has a lot of different configurations. So as we kind of get used to the new desk and the configurations, we'll have a lot more use in the library. Um, but we continue to prepare in other areas as well. As you can see here, here's our computer area and we have the plexiglass screens up as well for when people are inside of the building. Uh, we also added a video doorbell like many uh, city departments. Uh, here's ours um, on the front door. Um, that is a really handy feature. I think unlike many uh, city departments, we have a lot of people walk up to the building at all times of day and ask us questions. And it gives the staff a really great way to just have a quick conversation with somebody, whether it's a 
delivery or a reference question of, you know, we're still surprised with the amount of people who don't have access to internet services and need to like actually come up to the building to access or request materials. We actually had somebody um, use the video doorbell just yesterday to figure out how to send a print job to the library and get it printed out. So we are really glad to have that feature. It's a nice little added security and it also is really helpful as well. You also may have seen this package out front. That's our uh, new book drop. It will be installed shortly when the kiosk is installed in front of the city hall building. Um, our idea will be to continue the drive up book drop service into the future. That's a feature that people really enjoy and, um, and really adds a level of convenience to uh, people's lives. So we'll, we'll do that. And we'll also have one, you know, for people who walk up to the building. Um, a couple of just quick program highlights. One of the things we did start it to support our seed library is our seed video series. Um, Candy in TV 10 did a great job uh, putting together this presentation, um, you know, and really, you know, giving some people some seed starting basics along with our, you know, ongoing story time services. We're excited to offer more uh, virtual programming. Um, we also have a new STEM activity that's available. We have these new Ozobot robot kits um, that people can check out. We had these Ozobots for our STEM activities in the library, and we realized that for just a few dollars, we could buy these nice hard shell cases and check them out to the public. And so now we have this great new STEM activity that uh, parents can do with their uh, kids in their household, the Ozobots are really fun. You use these colored markers and you can draw pathways and make them light up. It's really the basics of coding language um, and you can do it you know, in a real visual way. So it helps uh, you know, a lot of people gain you know, intrigue level coding skills you know, by making it a fun activity. So we really enjoy having that. And, and you know, to our delight, it, they have been checked out a number of times since we've had them and we've had no problems with them coming back. So, you know, just a great service that we've been offering as well. Um, we also started our first cooking class. Uh, as you know, a couple of years ago, the library, uh, you know, really, you know, took the lead in doing some more, um, you know, nutrition focused education in the community with teens. And uh, we had the idea that we could just uh, do a very similar uh, cooking class uh, again um, with a really low cost materials. So we're just thinking about low cost recipes. Um, and then we do uh, it where you can request a kit from the library, come and sign up for the class and then do it virtually over Zoom. We had the first class uh, yesterday and it went really well. And we saw a lot of successful you know, in-house cooking. So it's just another way to kind of, you know, help teens gain the skills they need for everyday practical life. Uh, we did start uh, signups for our March, March murder mystery game. It's our, our sort of fun curbside activity this month. Um, and it incorporates a number of downtown businesses and downtown businesses have actually donated to support uh, this project. Um, and it is very popular. Uh, right now, we have 54 signups for our March Ministry game. I wouldn't be surprised if we have over 100 by the time we actually get rolling in a week or so. Um, it was a great, uh, innovative way that the staff uh, thought to engage the public. And we, you know, not only have uh, great book selectors on our staff, but also, you know, published authors on our staff. So. One of the fun things about this mystery game is it's actually pretty well written. So it will be a fun adventure for people to do over the coming month. Um, uh, another activity we did, a uh, kind of uh, teen program that we just offered was the uh, uh, teen program where people learned how to paint windows. We had our local art, uh, author, uh, artist Deidre help us uh, begin to paint the windows at the library. We've painted four beautiful uh, panels kind of to get ready for um, the Skagit springtime. Uh, these are not quite done yet. Uh, just FYI, they don't have the fine details, but it was, um, you know, the start and really, you know, where team volunteers and, you know, classroom attendees could really, you know, do. So it's, I think, a great way to sort of show that Skagit spirit as we enter the springtime. And in a couple of weeks, the tulips in the library garden themselves will be up and it will be a wonderful compliment um, together, I'm sure. Um, 
Just one quick note as, on capital support as we move um, forward. I know a lot of you um, don't know this or haven't been involved with the library as much, but we do have uh, two organizations that support the library, the Friends and the Foundation. The foundation is really focused on capital support um, as we get going into uh, the library um, commons project. Um, they can provide uh, a number of different supports. Uh, in fact, they're working right now on a campaign for Library Giving Day. Here's just a quick uh, little uh, ad that they're working on for running in the local paper. Um, and really engaging with the public around just that sort of continual giving to the library. They have a number of different projects planned for this year and some events as well. Um, uh, staff has also been fairly successful at applying for grants and we will continue to do that um, as we move forward into this construction phase as well. Um, there's also a really sophisticated uh, development network here in the state of Washington. Um, the Seattle Public Library Foundation is the fourth largest library foundation in the country and the second largest for a public library. Presidential libraries, of course, have some of the biggest foundations. So they have a wonderful network um, that we've been engaging with and learning the best tips and tricks to uh, share a library message with the community and we will continue to kind of plan and develop here at the library to support that goal as well. So just kind of quick heads up on that um, screen. Um, and that's all I had tonight. So thank you. Any questions for Isaac? A lot of updates. Okay. Thank you, Isaac. All right. Uh, moving on then under item C. Item C is our council member comments. Any council member comments tonight? Just make a kind of a quick report on the uh, fireworks committee that uh, this is kind of a subcommittee of the council. It's made up of of a couple of uh, residents. Um, we've had room for more uh, residents if if anybody's interested in participating in it. Uh, what we're doing is is coming up or developing a survey uh, to get input from uh, from the residents of Mount Vernon on uh, firework usage within the city limits and their thoughts and kind of to give direction to the council as far as any actions that may or may not need to take place. We were hoping to uh, complete the survey this evening, but best laid plans didn't go as laid. Um, so we're gonna be uh, finalizing that over the next uh, two or three days. Our intent is just to get this um, survey up on the website, hopefully mid next week, um, and then let the public uh, know that that's there through a, a number of means and uh, get public input. So just a quick up, update on the uh, fireworks committee. Great, thank you so much, Mark. I appreciate it. And the council members that are serving on that, uh, council member Beaton and Morales. So thank you. All right. You know other ones, we'll go ahead um, under mayor's reports. I am going to attempt to share my screen. See if we can get this. Can someone let me know if they see this slide that says findyourphase.org? Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so um, just wanted to share some good information. Uh, again, just reminding our public that the, the city does not have a public health department, but we want to help get information out. So this is from the Skagit County Health Department regarding vaccinations. Um, if you're not sure what phase you're in, please use the tool findyourphasewa.org. And uh, of course it changes. Uh, we were happy in my household, my husband is a teacher, so he um, was able to get moved up on that list before we headed back to the classroom. Um, they, uh, they have started at the county receiving a lot more vaccinations, uh, vaccine, I guess I should say. Um, and so they are doing new appointments. If the availability is announced each Saturday at 9 a.m. on the Skagit County webpage. So if folks go to skagitcounty.net forward slash COVID vaccine, or they have a vaccine hotline that's operated Monday through Saturday from eight to five with both English and Spanish speaking call takers. So folks, if they don't have internet access or have difficulty, they can make a phone call at 360-416-1500 um, in order to schedule um, vaccinations. 
Uh, the county public health is only one of several places to get vaccinations. So check with your local physician uh, or your pharmacy um, and see if they have openings there. But um, I think as we continue to move along from week to week, more and more vaccinations will come become available. And I believe today's report is over 20% of our county has initiated at least the first dose. So, um, so numbers are, are moving up. So that's really good news. Uh, the other uh, item that um, has been kind of out there today, especially, is the American Rescue Plan Act that was passed by both the uh, both houses in Congress and will be going to the president's desk. Um, I sent a quick Im informational email to council about this just this afternoon, but thought I'd share a little bit that we know about. Um, all cities and towns in the United States will receive funding. Um, I think it's pretty historic action. The estimated funding for the city of Mount Vernon could be around $9 million. Um, we're kind of waiting for those final calculations. Um, not only does funding go to cities and towns, but there's other priorities in the act, which means direct funding for school districts, direct funding for businesses, including direct funding for restaurants, um, unemployment, direct rental assistance, housing, child care, WIC, SNAP, and public health, um, just to name a few. There's also other direct funding sources. So what I think will be very important um, going forward and had a conversation with Commissioner Lisa Janicki about this is that to see about uh, kind of coordinating um, the funding um, between both governments and, and other maybe nonprofits or schools or things so that we really take uh, the best advantage of funding that could come to help in our recovery. The funding that's coming to the cities, there's some basic parameters uh, that we know of at this point. Uh, they should be used to respond to the pandemic to cover costs incurred as a result of the public health emergency. It can replace lost, delayed, or decreased revenues. It can address the negative economic impacts of the pandemic, and it can make necessary investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. So those are just the high level that we know of right now. We will also, as cities, have the authority to transfer funds to private nonprofit organizations, public benefit corporations, or special units of local or state governments. And the way it will be distributed once it becomes law, we will receive our first distribution between 60 and 90 days, and another distribution after a year from that date. And we will have until December 31 of 2024 to spend those federal dollars. Um, it's going to be important that we spend them the right way because of course we're subject to federal audit um, to see where all of the, this money does go. Um, we do believe that we will be receiving this money um, sooner than maybe some other cities. Um, we are one of 24 what they call entitlement cities in the state of Washington, where we have direct CDBG funds that come to our city. And so because we have that sort of infrastructure of relationship already, um, we believe that our funding will be coming uh, perhaps quicker than to um, other cities that aren't direct entitlement cities. So, of course, there's a, a, a lot of work to be done around this as um, the, the bill becomes um, law. Uh, AWC is going to be a good resource for us, as well as Department of Commerce here in the state of Washington, um, to make sure that we understand the uses and we understand the reporting um, as the money comes to the city. So. Um, that's just the information I have uh, today, since that all happened today. Um, I also was on a call with other um, legis or other electeds from our state um, with uh, Senators Murray and Cantwell's offices. And so they discussed this bill uh, as well. They discussed other things they're working on. The next priority is infrastructure bill, um, passage of that, focusing a lot on transportation infrastructure. Um, but it was really nice to get updates from those offices as well. So that's the my manager report tonight. I don't know if there's any questions. Probably don't have the answers yet on the funding, but okay. All right, moving on. Item E is our council committee agenda requests. And I just wanted to give an update. Council member Holst had asked for um, uh, to talk through city council code uh, around committee agenda requests themselves. So I was hoping to have that on our agenda for committee time on the 24th. Um, so it's in two weeks, if that's okay. We'll put that on there, okay. 
Great. Any other council committee agenda requests? Okay, moving on then, uh, under new business tonight. Item A is our Wastewater Treatment Plant 2019 Outstanding Performance Award, and Public Works Director Esco Bell is here to tell you about this item. Esco. Thank you, Mayor. We've been informed by the Department of Ecology representative, representatives that the city's wastewater treatment plant staff have received DOE's Outstanding Performance Award for 2019 and for its achievement for 10 consecutive awards. And the background and basis for the award is summarized as follows. In 1995, DOE began the awards program to recognize operators and staff of wastewater treatment plants who successfully maintain perfect permit compliance for one year. Mount Vernon has received the Outstanding Performance Award for 97, 2000, 2004, 2006 through 2008, and 2010 through 2019. This record of performance is especially excellent considering that many plants have never achieved 100% compliance and 10 consecutive years of awards places the city staff's performance among the very best in the state. In addition to meeting discharge limits for a number of pollutants, other requirements of the discharge permit, such as sampling and testing frequencies, reporting, record keeping, and maintenance of equipment and facilities are also evaluated. DOE reviews every treatment plant's reports and conducts on-site inspections to determine which facilities met all conditions of their permits. So, um, you know, and this is especially our plant, incidentally, is not the simplest plant in the world, you know. Uh, us geeks know that to have like uh, a dry weather flow of, you know, 3 million gallons and then have, you know, during the winter flows that go over 20 million gallons, plus the, the central CSO regulator, you know, that's this big attenuator. Look, it takes a little bit of skill and gymnastics to keep that thing going and make this perfect permit compliance. But I know I'm on the choir, so I'm biased. But <laughs> we're really proud of them. And here's this fancy plaque that basically says uh, some of the things I already said and good thing we're doing that admin building improvement so they got more wall space because they need it for these plaques. <laughs> okay. Great. Well, we uh, we want to congratulate our staff. If we were in person, of course, we would uh, be shaking hands and high-fiving. Gary Duranzo, our manager, is here. So thank you, Gary, for all the thank hard you. work with your crew. Yep. It's pretty awesome to say that that uh, we're pretty darn perfect for a decade or more. Thank you. So. <laughs> Appreciate it. Can we, Jill, I'd like to say, Gary, when we are back in person, I want you to come in so we can give you a round of applause. <sighs> okay. That's fabulous. Yeah. That's fabulous. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Okay. Good news. Thank you so much. All right. Yay. All right. Item uh, B tonight is the okay. approval of an agreement with HDR Engineering, and someone asked ESCO to run you through this and a, a slight correction on the memo as well. So, Thank ahead. you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, staff recommends that a motion be made by Council approving a consultant agreement with HDR Incor Engineering Incorporated in the amount of $338,370 for wastewater treatment planning collection system consulting services. Now, we, we corrected, as the Mayor says, the item in our memo to the packet it said 327 128.68 dollars and there that was uh there was a glitch in that we went through it made sure that's correct but i also want to assure you that this is the kind of contract anyway that's time and materials and it has several different items so you know in any case we can't go over that amount that you say there without further permission from you but we won't even necessarily, you know, we spend that, like I say, as we go on different things that I'll describe a little bit more with some background. HDR, HDR Engineering Incorporated has prepared bid documents for the procurement of a rotary drum thickener, which is currently out to bid. It's a fundamental part of our treatment process. It's, it's currently out to bid with a delivery date of summer in 2021. Under the proposed agreement with HDR, they would also prepare installation bid documents and they'd serve as our construction management firm for the installation of this important piece of equipment. Additional services under this agreement that we would have are a combined sewer overflow assessment, that CSO, which will include evaluation of improvements and performance of the central CSO regulator. Following the evaluation, the current CSO reduction plan amendment will be developed. These are all things that we need to be doing in permit requirements. You always are working to raise the bar 
we're always trying to keep in that uh, we have like one discharge allowed per year. So we always are on top of this topic and, and HDR helps us with that with fundamental advice. Another item they will help us with is to assist the city with compliance with this that I talked to you about earlier in the report, the Puget Sound Nutrient General Permit. They will help us in the development of a nutrient optimization plan, which will be our important part of telling DOE how we're gonna meet our limits by operational planning and how we do that. That's what that is. And then lastly, uh, provide continued on-call support for treatment plant uh, processes, maintenance and miscellaneous project ass assistance. Uh, I will say just further that HDR, of course, is a, a large engineering firm with all kinds of organizational capacity, but we also here in the Seattle area have, uh, you know, they're an A-team and they have worked on our plant uh, in many different ways. Uh, we have some of the best around. They travel around the country and do different things. And they, it is a very successful relationship. They're definitely the best qualified for the work we're doing here. And, uh, and they uh, dovetail with our staff really well. And uh, we got a long record of success. So I would, uh, and so also all this stuff is of course in, uh, they're in the scope of approved funds for wastewater, which is uh, one of your larger budgets, of course. Staff recommends approving the consult agreement in the amount of $338,370 from HDR Inc. for consulting services essential to the city's weight wastewater treatment services. Okay, questions for ESCO on this particular item. Thank you for the explanation, ESCO. Event Mayor. I'd move to approve the um, mayor entered an agreement with HDR uh, Engineering. I'll second that motion. Thank you. So a motion by Gary and a second by Juan. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any Thank opposed? You. Any opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Thanks, Esco. Thank you, Mayor and Council. All right. Uh, item C is yeah. the approval of the second extension agreement with Waste Management. Go Thank ahead. you, Mayor. Uh, okay, as as I talked to, we're of course working on this recycle, uh, curbside recycle contract, and we still, that's an ongoing process. You, you know, we've already talked about the prices and everything else. Waste management, we've got more work to do. Uh, so let me, let me read my script here a little bit. Staff recommends approval of a short-term contract extension for residential collection, processing, and marketing of curbside recyclables with waste management from April 1, 2021 through May 31st, a two month extension of the current contract. Waste management provides city's curbside recycle services and it's gonna expire April 1. City's been working on this, but we need two more months to complete that effort. In the meantime, they've offered to extend the current uh, existing contract. However, we need to implement uh, the dollar increases uh, described as follows. The residential recycle services are proposed to increase from $5.92 per month to $10.54 per month with this, uh, with this agreement. And then the residential organics, which are not mandatory services, they're by subscription. Those services would increase from $12.69 per month to $13.36 per month. So again, uh, we're asking that you uh, approve this two month short-term agreement with waste management so that we can uh, proceed with uh, the work and over the next couple of months and show you that uh, complete contract. I'd move the council approve the uh, contract extension with uh, waste management. Second. Motion by Mark and a second by Iris. Any further discussion? All right, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, just also for council, um, waste management has helped us and we put together a mailing that will go to all the customers direct to their home um, to indicate the, um, the increase in rates. Um, so that'll go directly to the customers. 
Um, I can't remember the exact timing of that, but um, it's going out pretty soon. And Doug can maybe help me if, if he heard that. Also, um, on the next mayor's e-newsletter, it'll be the front page uh, story. So we're going to try and get information out um, to all the customers before it happens. So. Mayor, I believe it's going up. I believe it's going out on the week of the 21st. Week of the 21st of March. Okay. Sorry, Gary, go ahead. Um, are, are you going to put uh, some of the information that ESCO talked about just explaining, you know, I mean, because it could, it just could bring up a lot of questions like I, I, I want to get out of the garbage, you know, or I want to get out of just recycling. Are, are you going to talk about in that? So what I did was I had made a little note. We think the same way, Gary, um, that we okay. uh, we put together like a little one page informational uh, thing that we can post on our website on our front page of our website, which talks about the rates going up. So we'll, we'll at least when folks call, we'll be able to point them or, or email in the information. Perfect. Um, I'll send that actually, we'll send that out to city council as well. So you'll have it if you get contacted by people. So, okay. Okay. Um, Thank you, Mayor Council. Let's see. Uh, we're on item D, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> item D is the approval of supplement number five to agreement with Reichert Nebe Engineering and Bill Bullock, our city engineer is here. I think Bill's doing this one, right? We're at ESCO. Okay. I think ESCO is doing this one. Item D oh. or me? Oh, never mind. I, I was on the wrong page. I apologize. Okay. There you go. And also uh, to remind council, this is one that we had some errors in. So we had reissued the council memo on Monday, so make sure you're on the right council memo. So this is regarding our uh, College Way and 30th Street signal. We have some more expenses to go through to wrap this up uh, and close out. We've had some different, shall we say, additional inspections in, with WashDOT through the COVID piece related to the uh, WashDOT's uh, reduction in staff. So we did a lot of our final inspections without washed up, but did uh, photograph measurements and different things to send into them so that we could uh, make that work. So we just have a little bit to get across the finish line, and this is the amount of money that will do it. We are still uh, within about 5% of our original budget for a project that ended up getting delayed a year because of the polls and different things. So uh, uh, we are... Uh, TBD funding will probably uh, come out and fund this last piece uh, to make up for that difference, but we are getting ready to wrap this thing up and close it out. Are there okay. any questions? Any questions for Bill on this? I move that we let the mayor enter into the agreement supplement number five with Reichert Needy. Second. Second. Motion by Mary and a second by Mark. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries. Thank you. Item E is the approval of an agreement with Reichert and EB Engineering. Bill. Thank you. So this is our uh, contract agreement for professional services for the design of Hogan LaVenture Road Signal or intersection improvements as we call it because it involves more than just a signal at that intersection. We went through a fairly extensive selection process and ultimately Reichart and EB was the preferred candidate. Uh, this is a TIB funded project. We're 200 and Forty-six to two hundred forty-eight thousand dollars slated for the preliminary engineering, so they are right in that ballpark. And uh, this is uh, asking for permission for the to execute a contract with Rikardimi to begin the design work. We intend our our uh, target for this is to have this designed and bid ready by January or February of next year for construction next year. All right, questions for Bill. I don't have any questions. Um, I'd like to make a motion that council authorize the mayor to execute a contract with Reichert Nebe for engineering design services for Hogan LaVenture intersection. Second. Thank you. So a motion by Melissa and a second by Mary. All those uh, in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Motion carries, thank you. 
Thank you. I think it uh, serves our community well when we can really bring home grants to help with these pretty major transportation projects. So thank you for Bill for that work and ESCO and our public work staff. So. We're excited about it. All right, so um, item F is uh, for the good of the order pandemic response and discussion. Um, I just shared that in the mayor's report about vaccinations. Um, so I really don't have a, a lot of anything else to share unless someone has questions that I could at least point information to you. So, okay, great. Um, with that, we have completed our agenda items. I would ask our city attorney if we need an executive session this evening. You do, Mayor. I'd invite the city council to meet in executive session for a period of 20 minutes to discuss with legal counsel matters relating to enforcement action, litigation or potential litigation to which the city, the governing party, or a member acting in an official capacity is, or is likely to become a party and public knowledge regarding the discussion is likely to result in either adverse legal or adverse financial consequence to the city, pursuant to RCW 42.30.110 subsection 1i, and to discuss issues related to collective bargaining sessions in planning or adopting strategy or positions related to collective bargaining, which is exempt from the Open Public Meetings Act pursuant to RCW 4230, 140 subsection four. 20 minutes, no action after. All right, thank you. We will be adjourned then into executive session at 7.08. I would ask council to hold on while PD10 clears us for uh, that executive session. Thank you.